I'm Frankie Sees, and you're watching Notes, a Paratif's behind the scenes interview series featuring Detroit's house music community, the producers, the DJs, the venues, the patrons, and promotions. This segment features producer and DJ Dion Jomar. Did I pronounce that right? Jamar. Jamar. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting here in this space, one of noteworthy footprint, leadership, and forward thinking in the history of techno music, I extend gratitude to Submerge, located at 3000 East Grand Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan, which houses Underground Resistance record label and uh, Exhibit 3000, the first techno museum in the world. Dion, I smile and a big smile as I reflect upon my introduction to you about four years ago. Mm -hmm. UFO Factory, Marble Bar, TV Lounge, all memorable. Now, let's take it to the booth, front and center, as we begin this journey into your life as a DJ producer. Mm -hmm. We're gonna start off with you telling us where you were born, grew up, and your introduction to the art of DJing and then production and mm. at what age? Okay, so born and raised in Detroit, uh, East Side particularly. And my introduction to DJing is simply my father. My father was a DJ, uh, he still is. Um, yep, and that was just my intro. He was always banging every weekend, all kind of music. Uh, you know, hip hop, R&B, funk, soul, house, techno, all of it. You know, Detroit DJs. You know, we play everything, cabaret style. So that was my introduction to DJing. Um, production. My introduction what was actually my introduction to production. I don't know. I, I grew up around a lot of spoken word people originally, poets, MCs. Hmm. So I would just be hanging around studios and, and meeting these kind of producers that would kind of just make beats for like rappers and singers and stuff. And um, it wasn't until much later that I met um, a very dear friend of mine, John C. He is actually the guy where I really saw just like a producer, mm -hmm. you know, like he make his music. Um, he doesn't necessarily make it for artists. He will, but that's not the focus. The focus of the music itself, the beats. And uh, he introduced me to like Jay Dilla's music, Slum Village, all that stuff, and the underground Detroit hip hop scene. And then also he introduced me to Three Chairs, you know, the underground dance music scene of Detroit. Yep. So, yeah, that's my introduction. Now. Oh, and I was about, uh, well, DJing my whole life, but I was exposed. But production, I was about. Mm, 18 years old. Okay. Yes. So, can you tell us who the three chairs mentioned who they are? Because I find it interesting um, when I had spoken to you before about interviewing you, and you took me into the history of how you actually became connected to them, and you shared a little bit more then yeah. than you did than you're doing now. So, could you just give us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, to elaborate, like I said, uh, my, my good friend, John C., um, and we met through music, like many of my friends. But um, yeah, I told him one day to make all these mixed CDs. You know, it was just putting songs on the CD. And I told him like, hey man, I'm thinking about getting into DJing. You know, you know I like everything from Della to Donald Bird, all that stuff. So he was like, hey man, you need to check out Three Chairs. I was just like, who? He was like, you don't know Three Chairs? And then he wrote, I wrote the names down. It was Rick Will Height, Kenny Dixon Jr., Theo Parrish, and Marcellus Pittman. And uh, he actually was good friends with Marcellus because uh, the two of them were in a hip hop group together called Homegrown. And um, literally I went from, I went to YouTube, you know, that's how I discovered them, YouTube. <laughs> and uh, it was interviews like this where I was able to get into like their philosophy and just mm -hmm. hearing them talk about the music, mm -hmm. right? I wanted, I was happy to hear that before I ever even heard them DJ or any of their music. Cause it kind of showed me like, dang, that's me. Like that's my, it's like my cousin, especially Marcellus, because he's really from the east side, you could tell too. I was like, dang, man, Theo, Theo was real, you know, you know Theo, he's real like, you know, hypercritical about his approach to music and and very intentional. 
and I was very attracted to it. And Kenny, then Kenny was just like, <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to say. Kenny was like ever the showman about it to me, you know. And then Rick, I didn't have as much content on. So anyway, I went from the interviews to the music. And then when I started hearing the music, I was like, oh, this is like the intersection between dance music, hip hop, jazz, R&B, all that. They're infusing all of the influence that I grew up on and making this new thing. Well, it was new to me. Uh, we talking about literally 2013 when I was exposed to them. So I, I literally went from YouTube and these guys to, like I said, my friend John, he introduced me to Marcellus and I went to his studio and like, uh, he was like, oh, you getting into DJ? And he like gave me a needle, you know what I'm saying? Gave me a bunch of test presses that were not out yet in Unirhythm Records. And then maybe a couple months after that, I met Theo. So like, this literally like, I go from YouTube and these guys never heard of them to going like, oh wow. And them being real inspirational from afar to like, I actually got to meet them as people, mm -hmm. be in their studios. Mm -hmm. And then when I got in their studios, then I saw a whole nother level of, oh, they make beats that like are meant for sound systems, are meant for okay. dancing, you know, and not just boom, tiss, boom, tiss. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like they really are producing um, music. It ain't just like house, you know what I mean? They make music. And they, but but it is like inclined for sound systems and dance floors, which I could relate to. Like I said, because my dad was a DJ. So I was just like, okay, I get this. Now, some of the stuff I couldn't get yet until I heard it on the sound system, because that's what it was for, you know? Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I have here in my hand my notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have bumped it up from 28 to 30 questions. Okay. Of which... He has randomly selected six. Now, he has not been giving these questions beforehand. So, we're going to dive in a little bit deep. So, let's get down. All right. You chose question number three. Okay. What's your music choice in your downtime? Mm, in my downtime? Depends on how I feel and how, how, what's the emotion, you know? Sometimes my downtime is, sometimes I spend my downtime just learning the music that I'm going to DJ. Like, I will be just chilling on the porch listening to some some dance music. Or I'll be listening to, like, some jazz, you know, like Donald Byrd, something like that, McCoy Tyner. It could be some hip-hop. Like, earlier I was just listening to Ghostface Killer, Supreme Clientele. It just depends on how I feel. Okay. Yeah. Question number two, which is question number 11. Your go-to track when you know you're hot on the box. Okay. And if you've ever been cold on the box, mm, go your go-to track. Woo! Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> so that's easy on the hot end. On the hot end, because... Yes. And I have my dad's copy of this, and I stopped bringing his out because I bought... And I bought, like, two copies since. But No Way Back, Adonis. When I play, when it's, when it's like really beating and it's going down in Detroit, yeah, I die and it's no way back. But I always play the instrumental because I don't like the soul of my soul. I lost. I don't like that part. But I die it's no way back when it's hot on the box because it's like it's automatic. It's going to carry the energy. It might even take it to another level. And it's highly programmable. It's easy to get into something else from that. And everybody knows it too. So it's like. Okay, so that that's my hot one. And my cold, now it's cold, and oh, I'm trying cold. to build it. It's cold. Is it early in the set or in the middle? Or well, where we at? I'm not giving you any parameters. Other it's just than cold. It's just cold because I've seen this happen. Mm. DJ starts out hot, yeah, and I'm a dancer, mm. so I'm right there. Mm. And then all of a sudden he drops a track, and it's just like, oh, why did he play that? Mm -hmm. So you could be cold really mm -hmm. at any point mm -hmm. in your set. Mm -hmm. Well, I ain't gonna lie, my go-to grounding mechanism song, and I ain't gonna lie, it's, it's really for me. It's Wind Parade by Donald Byrd. Oh, yes. I always bring that, and it's, I bring that to, I kind of bring that to be like, you might have not expected me to play this. I know that you love, I know that you know that, in Detroit especially, I know you know this, I know you love this. And even if you don't, I love it, and it's gonna make me 
get comfortable and settle in and you could kind of let it breathe and let it play mm -hmm. or you can cut into it when they go da -da 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 <laughs> and then sometimes it drops something right there or yeah. sometimes i can mix into the drum it's giving me options and again like it's taking me back home it's taking me back like hold on we in a club but nah we in a living room chill you know yes. we in parade that's that's the one i usually kind of break the ice so like all right relax Dion. okay yeah Number three, which is question number 15, your music story. Hmm. What are you conveying? What are the feelings that you are trying to invoke in the audience? If you need me to explain that a little bit more. Oh, no, that's, okay, yeah, because that's, for me, family, always. Like, okay, I give you, this is the main thing. Like, right before I leave out the door, almost at every gig, I go, okay, what if one of my aunties walking here? You know what I mean? Like, I don't want them to be embarrassed, you know? I don't want to be embarrassed with something I'm playing or the energy or where I'm playing, any of that. I want it, I want it to always feel like, okay, one of my friends could walk in here and be like, oh, okay, my cousins, you know? So, but also beyond that, like, literally the feelings that I felt uh, in the basement parties and in the backyard parties and the cabarets that I had no business being at. My dad took me to when I was a kid, like, those feelings, because those was like real community, you know, love, basically. I want people to feel love, you know. I want them to feel lighter when they leave. I want you to take it into the week with you, yes. you know. Take it, take this memory into the rest of your life, hopefully. And it ain't got to be about me. It's just, that's the thing. You know, people work usually, what, five days a week. The weekend come, that's when you get to go out and let loose. And it's my job to help you let loose, you know? Sweat it out, close your eyes, dance, look foolish, whatever, you know? And uh, yeah, that, that's what I want people to feel, love. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I hope that wasn't okay. too, too long with no, you. No, that's excellent. Okay, <laughs> question number four, which is question number 21. Okay. Your set, is it free-flowing or pre-arranged? Um, it's always free flowing. So with D what most DJs do, good ones, uh, <laughs> is they practice a lot. So when you practice in their home, you know, you come up with some combinations and stuff like yes. that. But you but what I had to learn, it took me years to learn that I'm like, dang, why is it hitting different out than it, than it was at home? Like at home, this was way sweeter. Well, I think it's because well, so when you get in from around people, you ever notice you can listen to a song you really love, right? By yourself, right? And who you really love it. But when you listen to with listen to that same song with me now, now depending on how I feel, is gonna uh, impact. You know what I mean? How the song literally sounds. So it's like you you gotta be you have to be improvisational a little bit in the moment because you're not just playing in a vacuum. There's no perfect set. The perfect set is you know the perfect song to play now is you know the song that you know the best that can work for the energy to react in the moment right now. So if you prearrange your set, like those sets are never gonna take no, prearranged sets are very like, good luck with that. Cause how you know, you don't know, you know, you don't know the trajectory of the night. You don't know if it was a rainstorm, people came a little late or you don't know, you you know, that's kind of arrogant to me to prearrange a whole set. Now, like I said, with the practice though, there's still gonna be moments that you remember um, like for instance, like you had about the hot, hot on the box question, right? Mm -hmm. I know, I ain't gonna lie, I'll just give it away because whatever, these are classics. In my bag, almost every party, all in a row, are usually No Way Back, Cyber Tribe, and something else, like another high energy piece. And they all stay together. And I know that if I make it here, oh, it's going down. Now, you know what I'm saying? And it could have still been a great party and I didn't make it there. But if I make it here, it's going down. And you could argue that that's prearranged. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But, and sometimes I do go in and I go, again, it depends on how I feel. Sometimes I might go into the situation and go, this is the first song I'm playing no matter what, period. And I'm going to go from there. Okay. Yeah. But it's kind of like, like I said, though, I never like too much like to prearrange, though, because I want to react to the feeling of the moment right now. You know? Yes. Okay. Question number five, which is 24. Are you self-taught? 
do you have a mentor and if not, or did you ever have a mentor mm. um and how do you feel about that and also did you do you have formal education mm, in music yes okay no i have no formal education in music but um like i said earlier like so my original mentors can i name multiple i have two cuz i don't have yes, one yes i what i love about this series mm. and not giving you the questions beforehand mm. for me and this is how i live my life is being authentic mm. for me it's always some we are all teachers and we are all teaching something mm. so i feel that everyone has a voice and what they have to say is important so yeah. yes this is this is about you okay so like my original man i always say this my mother taught me how to listen and my dad taught me how to play Right. My mother taught me the importance uh, and she didn't like sit here and teach me like I watched how she applied music in her life. It's basically like medicine. You know, you know how you probably do this. You clean up the house. You got the music like cleaning mm -hmm. up. You cook the food. You know, all the kids is fed. All right, cool. Now the candle is lit. Now the music is getting different. You know, the shot is on now. You get the book on the couch, you know, set up the whole ambiance for the music. My mom taught me how to appreciate let music animate the space and animate your emotions, right? And then my dad watched that because, you know, they were together. And he was already DJing when they met. But I think that even being around my mama and my aunties helped my dad learn how to tap into that energy, you know? Wow. So my dad taught me basically, like, that, that like, ability to, to know what to play. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he's looking at them like, oh, if they're reacting like this to that, then, oh, I'm going to capture that. I'm going to respond with this. Or, oh, okay, it's coming to that level. No, I, I got I got more trajectory to go here. So anyway, my mom, my dad, my aunts and uncles, that, that's my foundation foundation. But then I, got, I have to give credit to, like, clearly, Theo, Parrish, right? Raybone, Jones. Uh, whew, man, so many. So many. Marcellus, got to give him credit. As, a, as some of a mentor. And all of these guys, it's not like they sat me down and went, you know, well, Theo, because we spent so much time together as I work with him, he, he, will, he really does say, yo, you need this song, you need that song. And like, yo, this is how you, yo, if sometimes you bring it in too fast, this is how you, you know, I've gotten a lot of lessons from a lot of older DJs that's been doing it for a long time. And I ask a lot of questions to those guys. But like, originally though, my dad, all day. Wow. I've watched him play so many sets and like you, like we were talking about earlier, I, I always saw my dad play by himself. He never really had guests or had to play for an hour. So I had a chance to watch him tell a story and build a night many a times. So that's where I get that ethic of like, it's not like I'm trying to be diverse. I just think that Detroit DJs, that's just what they do. That's what we do. We're diverse people. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I've watched him play jazz, blues, soul, R&B, hip-hop, house, ghetto tech, all in the same night. Bring it all the way back. You know, mm -hmm. slow. it's going to be the slow dance moment before the end, you know. So my dad is my original mentor. Though. All right. Yeah. Now, the last question. Mm -hmm. Six, which is number 29. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love this question. What has been your greatest exposure elevating your career thus far? Greatest exposure? I ain't gonna lie, not necessarily the gigs. Not necessarily the gigs. I wanna say actually the recorded mixes because those serve as an example for the people who weren't there and a reminder for the people who was there. And because of the internet, you know, I've been able to, you know, I, I got that premium account on SoundCloud where, where I can go and look at who's listening and where they're listening mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. Maybe people listening from South Africa and France and all over the world. Okay. That's my best exposure is just, and uh, and during the quarantine, uh, you know, in 2020, mm -hmm. man, I made like whew, at least 50 mixes and I posted online like maybe half of them. Um, and I think that got me a, a whole lot of exposure the mixes. But okay, if I had to say an event though, it would be my event though, because I think that you can get easily washed away in the 
like just playing parties because really the party and the venue is going to get the attention, not necessarily the DJ. But the DJ gets the attention when he has a residency, a home. And uh, now in Detroit, we're starting to see more residencies, but really you kind of have to build your own. So once I made my own night, which was the healing session, then I think people start taking me even more seriously. Like, oh, he's really about this. And then also when you have a residency, you can display your entire ethic, not just the songs you play, right? Mm -hmm. Like how the room feels, how the sound system, you know, how you want the sound to feel and the crowd. So the mixes help me display my skill and my tastes. But the uh, event that I've created helped me display my entire ethic and my whole intention, the healing session. So, yeah. Do you still have that residency, the healing session? Well, so the healing session is not really a residency because it doesn't exist like at a particular venue. So I don't do it um, that frequently, but I do it every now, every now and again. Right now, I have a residency at Willis Show Bar. Um, it's the called the Friday Night Funk, and I just started that. Uh, so that's like the most consistent thing I'm doing. But okay. the healing session, I just do when I can because I do it out of my pocket and I basically give it away for free, basically. That's, that's great. Now, yeah. why the name uh, Healing Sessions? Yeah. Because I'll tell you exactly why. I'm tell you when I had my aha moment. It was at Excursions at the Russell Movement Weekend 2000 and wait, 2015. Mind you, I already knew about DJing music. I already loved music, but I never really seen a dance floor like this before. Mm -hmm. It was black, but it was diverse. They was dancing. They weren't even really drinking. They weren't really talking like that. And it was banging. And it was like, not one of them like, mm -ts, mm -ts. you know what I mean? It was like really playing some good black dance music. And anyway, I tell this story to say that the feeling that I had that day, because my mother had passed the year before, right? Oh. So I had a lot of pent up, probably anger, sadness, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm to be honest, to be perfectly honest, I went to this party chasing a woman. I got to the party, I probably had like one drink the whole time. I didn't even talk to the girl that much. And I just danced for like five hours straight. Like, and I'm not like a dancer. I wasn't even a house head or none of that at the time. So I had a moment and I realized, oh, this is actually the point. It is music. It's healing. This is the point of us getting together. It's like a, almost a like, it's a cultural thing, right? Us bringing our people together with music. We've been doing that forever. And uh, anyway, so I wanted to create an event that kind of had that feeling. And I use the word healing, uh, uh, you know, really just to trigger people. Because even just like I use the word funk at this night, I use these words to trigger the reaction. I want you to come in the door with a certain intention. So you know what I'm giving you. And it's free, too. So you know that it's community. You coming in. The goal is to leave feeling better. It's not to come here and get fucked up on liquor and drinks and drugs. Even whatever, if that's what you want to do, that's what you do. But I don't provide that. I just provide the music, water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. And if people come and I I did that because I wanted to trigger that. That this is your point of being here, getting down. And also the social element of partying. I think a lot of DJs don't understand this. You could be playing a perfect, great set. Everybody's not going to dance. And that doesn't mean that they didn't enjoy themselves. Right. Because the other part of partying is the social element. Um, I think that that's also a part of this thing that we're doing is just bringing people together, you know? So I wanted to do that. That's that's why I did the healing session. All right. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay. We are about to wrap this up. Okay. What are you learning now? Learning. Yep. Uh, in this building that we're in right now, Submerge, I'm learning more and more about music production thanks to Mike, Mike Banks. And I know he, he's like in the shadows. He doesn't love being in the front. If anyone does not know who Mike Banks is, please look him up. He is one of our master teachers in the city, really in the world. When it comes to, some people just say techno, but really I just want to say modern black music because Anyway, I'm not even going to go into his history. You ask me what I'm learning. That's what I'm learning. I'm learning the history. I'm learning the technical aspect of, you know, I have a lot of records, but 
as a DJ, it's a natural progression to go from the DJing into the production end because you, you start hearing the music in your head. You start hearing loops and rhythms and ideas. So now I'm learning how to take these ideas and turn them into tools, songs, records. This is what Mike, what I'm learning. This is why I'm here in this building. I got a studio here now. And that's what I'm spending the most time learning and my new records, you know, because so, I still have a lot of learning to do in the art of DJing. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Last, is there anything else you'd like to say or want us to know about you? Mm -hmm. I would like to say... Um, not just for me, but for, and not even just for Detroit, uh, black dance floors. Um, black dance floors, is, we need it really bad. You know, our people all over the world, we contribute our greatest art and the greatest culture, the greatest music. Everyone loves us. But let's not forget where all of this music and art and beautiful creativity come from. It comes from really like a lot of our pain, suffering and triumph over that pain and suffering. But the problem is, is that we're not in control of the situation. We're usually having to wait for someone outside of the community or culture to put us on stage or in position to do our art and do our work. And then our people have to come in an environment that's not their own. I think before I leave here, I want to increase the odds of us being on, not just on stage, mm -hmm. but behind the scenes, we need we need more black promoters. We need more black agency, management, travel agents. Every every aspect of this whole game, I need to see more of me. Mm -hmm. Not just DJs, not just producers. You know, downstairs there's a lathe. That's how they that they use to cut records. I need a young black uh, brother or sister to learn how to do that. Because that's how we get records, you know? Everyone wants to, wants to be the guy who's going to be the guy who, who you know what I mean? Yes. We need we need to be on every end of it. So I want to see more black dance floors and more black venues so we could kind of carry and tell our own story. Tell like our own said. story, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about your current residency. Yeah, the Friday Night Funk. So I just started that at the Willis Show Bar with the promotional company called Mean Red. Um, they're from New York. They just started doing a lot of programming in Detroit. Uh, they were doing a lot of stuff at Shane Park uh, 2020 mm -hmm. when things first started opening yes. up. So I appreciated them for that. That was like my first time dancing outside with strangers again, right? Mm -hmm. It was at Shane Park. First party I went to was Kai and Lady Monix. Yep. I was like, this is dope. So anyway, I had done an event with them at Willis called Soul Night. And then they hit me up about doing a residency. So I created the Friday Night Funk thing because like I said, I use words to trigger. And I know that funk automatically triggers a couple of things. It triggers like black dance music. Mm -hmm. That's it. I can really play like some Aaliyah is still funk. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like, I will always try to also name my events something that give me the freedom of selection but trigger the uh, reaction I'm looking for from the people. Mm -hmm. So it's just a night. Uh, we do a Willis Show Bar from 10 to 2. My next guest will be Marcellus Pittman. That'll uh, be my first time playing with him, big brother. At Willis Show Bar? At Willis Show and what's Bar. what's the date again? April the 8th, Friday, April the 8th. Yep. And uh, it's actually the day after our day. And where yeah. is Willis Show Bar? Uh, Willis Show Bar is uh, it was on 2nd. Second and Willis, yeah, in Midtown, Detroit. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And how can people follow you via social media? Um, on all social medias, um, just at Dion Jamar with an E, D E O N J A M A R. And you can find all those mixes I was talking about on my SoundCloud and uh, soon on cassette and CD too. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Come check out Dion playing happy. At TV Lounge this Thursday, April 7th, 6 to 9. Lounge to Deep House. I look forward to seeing you over cocktails, comp appetizers, chill, conversation, or what I love to do, hit the dance floor with me. It really <laughs> is all about being happy while enjoying delicious entertainment. Yes. <laughs> this is a TV Lounge in a pair teeth promotion. Thank you for watching, and you know, hit the subscribe button. D
Dion, I cannot. Thank you, Adnan. <laughs> yes. I have learned so much. You're such a young man with yes. uh, an incredible history and yes. perspective. And um, we will learn a lot from you as we continue to watch you and support thank you. you. Thank you thank so you. much. I appreciate uh -oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You. We'll see you guys next time. All Bye. Right. Yeah. <laughs>